Great. Thanks for the introduction, Tina. Uh, and I'm really pleased to be here today to chat a little bit about food environment policies. Um, so as Tina mentioned, I'm an assistant professor at the Université Laval uh, in beautiful Quebec City, and we even managed to have some sunshine and warm weather today, so that's quite exciting. Um, so today, I'm going to share a little bit with you about some of the work that myself and colleagues have done looking at local food environment policies and how we can identify some opportunities that can support making healthy and, and maybe even sustainable food choices. And so, apologies, my there's a bit of a lag between my screen, but I'll, I'll do my best. Just as a disclosure, um, so I do have research funding from the Canadian Institute of Health Research and the Public Health Agency of Canada, but I don't accept any funding uh, from uh, any food industry companies, although I have worked with some food industry stakeholders as part of my research looking at what food companies are doing uh, in Canada to help make healthier food environments. So a little bit of background, and I, I had a list of, to see uh, just who is joining us on the call, and it looks like we have a bit of a mix of people who are both inside and outside of nutrition, so I'm just going to go through some of these facts, and I don't think any of this will be particularly surprising to people, but we know that diet is a leading behavioral risk factor for mortality, both in Canada and globally, and this is from the Global Burden of Disease study. We know that globally, dietary risks, including under and over nutrition, as well as poor, poor quality nutrition, are actually the leading causes, behavioral causes, of death and disability. In Canada, we have big problems with what we're eating. 60% of adults and 70% of children aren't meeting sort of the basic requirements for fruit and vegetable intake. So if we say that we should eat eat five servings of fruit and vegetables, two-thirds, about two-thirds of us can't even achieve that. 20% of our food budget is spent on foods outside of the home, so that's in fast food restaurants um, and in takeaway restaurants. And this is increasing. When I started doing uh, my research, this was at about 22 to 24%. So over the last 10 years, we've seen a 5% increase in how much our budget is actually uh, is going to Food spent, uh, food purchased at home. And uh, in the 2004 CCHS, which now is a little bit dated and we'll have some more data coming soon, but when we look at indicators like if we adhere to Canada's food guide, there's less than 1% of Canadians who actually have a good quality diet. So, really, we have some pretty significant problems. And this is a major contributor to obesity in Canada. So. What we know is that obesity is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and certain types of cancer. Two thirds of adults have overweight or obesity in Canada. About a quarter of children also have overweight or obesity. And these, in, these rates are increasing monumentally and exponentially. So 300% in the last three decades, we've seen a 300% rise in rates of obesity among our children. And to me, what this signifies is that we have a problem. This is not a problem of choice or willpower. This is some sort of systemic problem that's causing two thirds of our adults and a quarter of our children to be uh, to be sick, um, and that higher rate of uh, illness. And so it really points to the need for environmental interventions that can address some of these things. And a lot of my work is focused on that classic public health paradigm of making a healthy choice the easy choice, in this case related to diet and nutrition. So when I think about environments and how those can be supportive in terms of our dietary choices, I use a food environment framework. This is the framework that's also used by Informis. I'm going to talk a little bit about the international network in a little bit. But basically, this framework is talking about the collective physical, economic, pol policy, and sociocultural factors, all of the things that influence people's food and beverage choices and then their nutritional status. So we, uh, we know that people live within these food environments and they make their choices within these environments. And there's three main players. There's the food industry, government, and society, who are the three main sort of stakeholder groups that can influence these food environments. Today, we're going to talk mostly about government 
uh, because that's what we're going to focus on and the different levels of government and how they can all play a role. So that's a nice technical definition, but what do I actually mean when I'm talking about food environment policy? And I think very often when we think about the food environment, we actually think about the physical built food environment. So often people's minds go right to retail spaces, so grocery stores, or the availability, how, how many, the density of fast food restaurants in different neighborhoods. And that's a really important part of the food environment. But there really is this sort of grander food environment that has a major influence on all of the food choices that we make. It starts from things like our agricultural products uh, and our agricultural processes that we invest in, the types of trade, the globalization of our food system and the types of trade that we, um, and trade agreements that we are part of, has a lot to do with the type of advertising for foods, not only just on foods, but how we're sort of always exposed to unhealthy food environments. And I promise you, this is a real picture I took at the University of Waterloo uh, several years ago in one of their gym facilities. And I just love it because I, I can't imagine this poor guy and, and what it's like for him to try to make a healthy food, uh, healthy uh, diet choice after he's been running on this treadmill for 45 minutes. It is, like I said, the retail environment, both in the store and outside of the store. So what we have to navigate as we're moving through the store aisles. And it's this constant availability of food as well. And lastly, it's the information environment. So how are, do we have nutrition information communicated to us and how can we understand it? And you know, this is sort of the premise for our food labeling and nutrition information environment right now. Um, and I have a PhD in nutrition policy and have a hard time understanding what all of these numbers mean. So I find it hard to imagine that we expect us, everyday consumers to navigate this information environment that we're giving them. Now, we have some good news in this area, and that is that we're in a period of significant global leadership and policy action in the area of food and nutrition, and there's a number of drivers for this. I think largely because we're starting to acknowledge that the rates of diet-related non-communicable diseases and obesity are getting beyond our control and have major economic and well-being impacts. And also because we're starting to have more conversations, not only about just the health of the people, but also planetary health. And so we're starting to have a few more conversations about what kind of policy action needs to happen. I'm going to give you some examples of some of the exciting um, advances. So I think uh, Chile is one that really stands out in terms of national policies. So in 2015-2016, Chile started implementing some really exciting and sort of vanguard policies in the area of food environment. In particular, they restricted advertising of unhealthy foods to kids. So Tony the Tiger is no longer allowed on Zucaritas or Frosted Flakes down south in Chile, which is an exciting advancement. And uh, when you see the pictures of what, the, what their cereal aisles look like in comparison, they're, they're very stark and contrasting. And then on the right picture, you can also see that the um, Alto and Azucares and Alto and Calorias, which is uh, their front of pack labeling system that they've implemented in Chile. So any foods that are high in any uh, nutrients of concern, so calories, fat, salt, and energy, have to carry these warning symbols. And this is very similar actually to something Canada and, and other countries have also introduced. And um, we're just starting to see some of the evidence from some of these policies being implemented. And so this is um, some very recent researchers, um, research from uh, colleagues down in, um, down in the US and in Chile. And, and what they found was that they've seen significant decreases in unhealthy beverage purchases after, uh, sorry, not purchases. This is in the um, purchase supply. So people are, me, people are purchasing fewer sugar-sweetened beverages or beverages that are high in salt or saturated fat um, across all parts of the population. So we're seeing some really good um, impacts of this. 
We also have seen one of the, I think, most commonly uh, discussed policy areas right now are sugary drink taxes or uh, food taxes on sugary foods. We've seen these implemented in both Mexico and the UK. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, some new results came out of the uh, UK suggesting that there's really been a significant decrease in the amount of sugar that's in sugary drinks in the UK. So if you look at this red line, this is sugary drinks that would be taxed. And you can see that they announced the first dotted line uh, on the left. That's when they announced there would be a sugary beverage tax. And you can see what the industry did is that they started to decrease. So the number of um, beverages that would actually qualify for the tax started to decrease. And here uh, on the right, that dotted line is when it was implemented in January 2018. And you can see that right around then there was also a really steep drop compared to the blue line, which is beverages that don't uh, have the um, tax applied to them. So just some of the emerging evidence to, to suggest that these policies that we as researchers have gotten quite excited about are actually having some impact. Now in Canada, we've actually had some really positive movements as well. So we have the healthy eating strategy um, that was uh, announced in 2016. And they proposed changes to Canada's food guide, which is, as we all know, were implemented. They have some changes to nutritional labeling, in particular in, uh, mandatory front of pack labeling, similar to what Chile has proposed. Uh, in addition, uh, they're proposing some restrictions on marketing to children, and then they're doing some work around limiting the amount of sodium in packaged and restaurant foods. Now, um, some of these things were uh, have sort of already been through the policy pieces and it was a bit it's a bit unclear exactly where they're going. I was uh, particularly excited to see that in the mandate letter, the letter from the Minister of Health, we did see that they did again support changes to the front of pack nutrition labeling and restrictions on marketing to children. So it does look like we are going to see some policy action in that area over the next little bit. And we also, of course, have a food policy for Canada. So uh, whereas the healthy eating strategy is really spearheaded by Health Canada, the food policy for Canada is uh, headed, spearheaded by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And they have some important mandates that could also really Im influence food environments. Um, and in particular of interest to me is that um, they announced that they're going to have discussions regarding a national school food program, which would obviously make make significant changes in terms of the foods that might be available um, to, to children in schools. So today we're going to focus mostly on local governments and that's because local governments implement some of the most novel food environment policies. So many of the policies that I've already talked about they're first implemented at the local level and then they sort of scale up. Local governments are oftentimes are more nimble and they're able to pass policies a little bit more quickly because they have a little bit less bureaucracy. Um, and so they're often sort of on the forefront of implementing some of these exciting policies. And local policies often spread or diffuse and generate support for other policies in other jurisdictions, either in neighboring jurisdictions or in higher jurisdictions. So for example, in provincial or national governments. We have some really concrete examples of how that happens. This is um, uh, an example of menu labeling policy in New York City. And I took this picture. Um, it, this was implemented uh, many years ago now in 2008. I love this picture because in the top left corner, you can see that the Baconzilla, um, if you have a combo, has about 1,500 calories, which I thought was quite shocking. I also love having an academic slide that says Baconzilla. Um, but this is an example where New York City implemented this policy in 2008. It was challenged by the food industry and they, they won. And after that was unsuccessfully challenged, then a number of smaller jurisdictions implemented menu labeling until eventually the, uh, basically food industry got on board and the government implemented the national level policy because it was actually preferable for the food industry compared to sort of this patchwork of different policies with different requirements in different municipalities. So it's a really nice example of how 
all of these, um, how these policies can generate some policy momentum. Uh, also, when we think about the sugar sweetened beverage taxes, um, so there's now eight jurisdictions in the U.S. that have implemented these. So Berkeley, California was the first, and it's sort of rolled out since then. And it's hard to know whether or not there, uh, there will be any national efforts in the U.S., but there's certainly gaining policy momentum at lower jurisdictions, and that also helps, has helped to provide some of the evidence and support for other countries as they're implementing these um, taxes. So just some nice examples of how these local policies really are quite important. So because we see so much uh, changing in terms of food environments and food environment policies, there's a lot more effort going into monitoring some of these food environments. So I mentioned that I'm a researcher with Informis, the International Network for Food and Obesity, uh, research, Monitoring, and Action Support. So this is led by Boyd Swinburne at University of Auckland, and uh, I'm leading some of this work in Canada with Mary LeBay at the University of Toronto. And so really, Informis has a sort of a mandate to monitor policies and how those are being implemented, and then how that actually changes the food environment. So some of the work that I did in my recent postdoctoral fellowship was to look at how Canada's food environment policies are comparing to the best and promising, most promising practices that are implemented globally. So Informis has, the, uh, has established these methods where a number of countries are using the same methods to evaluate food environment policies. So um, we've presented this work before, and so I hope I'm not going to be repeating uh, what you may have already heard, but Basically, I'm just going to give a quick summary of how we're doing sort of in Canada on a national level. So we looked at Canada's policies in seven policy domains. So food composition or what's in our food supply, food labeling, food promotion or marketing, the provision of food in public settings, as well as food retail practices, the price of food, and food trade and investment policies. And then six infrastructure support domains. So leadership, political leadership, and government, governance, so how transparent we are in our governance processes, uh, monitoring uh, of food environments, funding resources for food environment efforts, platforms for interaction between different stakeholders, as well as the health and all policies approaches. So we use the food epi tool, um, which broadly identifies what policies are in place, and then it rates the policies compared to international benchmarks or best practices. So as an example, Quebec's marketing to kids policy, where they don't allow any marketing to kids under the age of 13, uh, that would be a benchmark. And we would say, okay, if that's the benchmark, what's the Canadian government doing and how do they, how does it compare? And this rating was conducted by experts from across Canada. So, uh, 23, there's actually uh, close to 30 countries now who have proposed to implement this global food epi, so looking at national and, and uh, subnational policies. And this is what we found in terms of the policy environment here in Canada. And I've included a link here to the, the report, and we do have a national report as well as provincial level reports that might be of interest to you. And as well, I, um, if you're interested in sort of food environment policies, we also collated all of the policies that are in place in each of the provinces. So if you're wondering what sort of policies your, your province has in place, if you go to this website, you'll see something called evidence documents. That's where all the policies are collated. So if that's of interest to you, I hope you'll have a look. So here are our results in terms of um, how we're doing with policies. So darker bars mean we have better implementation or we're closer to meeting the international benchmarks or we might meet them. And lighter bars mean we have less implementation, so we're not doing as well. So what we can see here is that we're sort of doing pretty good in a few areas, in particular the infrastructure support, so the bottom half of this graph, but in terms of the policy areas in the top half, we're not doing as great. We found that there was very little or no implementation in particular with in relation to menu labeling, 
taxing unhealthy foods or beverages, such as sugary drinks, requiring healthy foods to be provided in government-funded settings, support for healthy food policies in food stores or food service outlets, so we're doing very little in the area of retail, as well as uh, any health and all policies approaches. So out of this activity, we also then prioritized some policy actions. So we had these 70 experts that we gathered from across the country to prioritize what actions the government might take. The first priority for them was prohibiting the advertising of unhealthy foods and beverages to children under the age of 17. The second was to implement targets um, for the food supply for not only sodium, but also free sugar and saturated fat and not only in packaged foods, but also in restaurants. And they suggested a structured voluntary approach, which is if companies are not meeting that, the, the thresholds that have been identified, then there will be a mandatory uh, requirement for them to do that. And the third was an excise tax on all sugary drinks and to make sure that that revenue was uh, reinvested in public health issues. So, we have in the healthy eating strategy targets for sodium, and we are hopefully going to have some restrictions to advertising of unhealthy foods. Unfortunately, right now it looks like that will only be under the age of 13, um, but we still, so we still have some, some clear work to do. In terms of infrastructure support, uh, the experts suggested developing population level intake targets for uh, nutrients of concern and fruits and vegetables to see just what we are consuming and, and how we're doing in terms of improving that. Um, changes to Canada's food guide, which we've actually already seen, um, as well as monitoring and revising the healthy eating strategy. So as I mentioned, we also have the um, provincial results. And I'm not going to go over this in detail, but dark bars mean we're doing well, light colors mean we're not doing that well. And what you can see is that uh, some provinces are doing better than others. So I'm uh, proud to highlight Quebec here um, has the, the highest level of implementation um, across uh, different policy areas. And some have, um, so, so uh, Saskatchewan has uh, relatively few areas where they're even meeting sort of low or moderate um, policy areas. So we do really see sort of this patchwork of policies in Canada. And um, so we have taken a look at how Canada does on the food epi and compared it to other countries. And what we saw was Canada was kind of middle of the pack. So some countries are doing better. There's certainly some who are doing worse. Um, no countries achieved a high score in either policies or infrastructure support. So overall, globally, we have lots of work to do. So. You know, we did this analysis looking at our national and provincial policies and, and uh, we're excited to, um, to, uh, to have a look at that. But we also wanted to understand, we, we recognized through our work that local governments in Canada were doing some really creative and exciting work. And so we wanted to see what kind of action local governments were taking to create healthier food environments. So this is part of the thesis work a master's student I worked with, Kimia Carbasi, um, and Mary, with, um, in conjunction with Mary LeBay at the University of Toronto. So Kimia, as her thesis, created the local food epi tool. So basically what we did is adjusted the local or the national level food epi tool so that it was applicable uh, on a local level. So this local tool not only acts as an inventory of some of the um, more common, commonly implemented local food environment policies in Canada and the US. It also provides a, uh, provides a policy framework so that we can evaluate uh, how different municipalities are doing. And it uses, um, it, uh, because it builds on the uh, larger food epi tool, it is, um, compares some of the policy implementation to these good practice statements that have already been established. And lastly, um, it helps us understand some of the regulatory capacity of municipal governments in obesity and NC prevention. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm hoping so. If not, if you mentioned something in the chat. 
Um, yeah. Great. Okay. So in terms of the local food epi framework, here is uh, what it looks like. So it looks very similar to the national um, to the, the national framework. We did find that we didn't have any local policies in terms of uh, agriculture and trade, so or trade and investment. So we do, we did remove that policy um, domain, and so there's six policy domains on the left, and seven infrastructure support domains. So um, all of the relevant ones from the food epi, except one additional one in terms of support for communities. And I'm going to break this down to talk a little bit about, in these areas, what those policies actually look like that we identified. So some of the most prominent ones that we saw and that were included in our framework in terms of the food supply were trans fat bans in restaurants. Um, and so this was implemented in, in the several uh, local jurisdictions, both in Canada and the U.S. Uh, in terms of food labeling, this was really focused on menu labeling because it's, uh, anything related to the packaged food supply is really out of the jurisdiction of local municipalities. In terms of promotion and marketing, we've, there were some policies around warnings on sugar, any sugar sweetened beverage advertisements. So in, um, in San Francisco, this was proposed as a policy option or restrictions on marketing to children on city owned properties. In terms of food pricing, taxing less healthy foods, um, so in particular SSBs there, we saw examples of that, as well as subsidizing healthy foods. And this is done in a number of different ways, sometimes through local uh, uh, farmers market coupons um, or promoting uh, uh, low price local produce to be sold in local farmers markets, this type of thing. In the policy area of food provision, um, we identified procurement policies that municipalities have put in place that require foods that are um, purchased through procurement policies to be healthier and to meet a certain nutritional criteria. Uh, there were a number of water consumption programs, so beverage policies to support consumption of water over alternatives like sugar-sweetened beverages, as well as uh, lunch programs, and those were specifically in schools and breakfast programs as well. And lastly, in the area of retail, we saw municipal policies related to drive-through bans, uh, supporting farmers market and uh, trying to make farmers markets as easily accessible as possible, as well as some in-store programs to help, uh, to help local um, providers provide healthier options uh, in a more accessible way. And then the support for communities, this sort of became a little bit of a catch-all because what we found is that there are a lot of unique and sort of novel initiatives um, that maybe are more in the area of programs or guidelines. They're less in the, um, and they're less policy-based, but still they're having uh, significant impacts on um, what kind of food environments that communities have. So in terms of community programming, we saw education programs, cooking programs, gardening programs, uh, healthy living programs, and community gardens. Social marketing campaigns in terms of healthy eating campaigns, think campaigns around sugar sweetened beverage consumption, reducing portion sizes and sodium intake. We found municipal programs related to food and nutrition curriculum, both in schools and community-based programming, such as um, in re recreation centers. And then some unique initiatives, so things like backyard chicken coops. We uh, saw some interesting um, policies around creating mascots, local healthy eating mascots that could be part of a local event. So these are just some of the support for community policies that we identified. So this is what the local food epi process looks like if to implement the tool. So we created the tool using this uh, systematic scoping review. We looked through all of the uh, sort of gray literature and the published literature to try to identify these policies. And we did a little bit of a, a crowdsourcing uh, campaign online to try to identify some of the exciting policies that are being implemented. That was mostly based out of Ontario with the support of the Nutrition Resource Center. 
Um, and in terms of the local food every process, so this is how this tool that we developed can be used. So first we take a look at the local policy context. We collect the relevant policy documents so we can understand what kind of policies have been implemented in each of the, in the jurisdiction. And then we worked with government officials to make sure that we verified that evidence to say, yep, these are actually the policies and programs that are in place, all of the pertinent policies. And then we hosted workshops where we brought in experts from different areas, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, to rate the extent of the government implementation by an expert panel. And after we did this workshop, as part of the workshops, we prioritized some of the policy and infrastructure support actions. And we did this um, with our, our stakeholders and with some of our government stake, in particular our government stakeholders, to help identify the real opportunities where um, experts who are working in the field know that there might be potential policy windows or there might be a little bit of momentum. And so these, this helped really inform our prioritization exercise. After that, we took a look at the data, we put, put it all together, and then we developed some reports and did our knowledge translation. And so Kimia piloted this process in three areas in the region of Peel, City of Greater Sudbury and City of Toronto. So we've now used this tool in three, three different um, jurisdictions with slightly different structures. And so this is part of understanding the policy context because there's both two tier and single tier um, I mean, uh, jurisdictions that we looked at. We looked at some different sizes, so both large and medium population centers. Um, we didn't look at any rural or small population centers. However, our tool does have some policy examples from rural uh, areas. And then we had to take uh, into account some of the provincial regulations, because I'm, as you all know, um, the provincial regulations sometimes can stifle action at the local level or sometimes it can support action at the local level and so we found several different municipal acts that sort of outline uh, what can be done and what must be done at uh, the municipal level as well as in Ontario there's the Ontario public health standards which have certain requirements and so therefore can actually bolster or support some um, activities related to monitoring food environment, some of the infrastructure support, as well as some of the policies. So here's what this looked like. We had uh, 21 experts in three different workshops. So they were from government. We brought in some experts from local academia when possible, as well as non-governmental organizations. And uh, this we included people from public health units, from city planning, um, from dietetics, in particular public health nutritionists, occupational health and safety, and local non-governmental organizations like some people from food policy councils. So these are just a few examples of some of the types of people we included. And I'm not going to go into great detail here um, because the, the point really wasn't to evaluate and certainly say, you know, who did better than, uh, which jurisdictions were doing better than others. We just wanted to see sort of if, if this was really feasible to implement. So here are the results from the city of Greater Sudbury. Uh, they had some really great um, policies and procedures requiring the use of evidence in some of their policy making. They had good transparency policies. And they had some local um, established a platform to talk about local food issues. So those were some of their strengths. And we did come up with prioritized actions uh, that they identified as being both highly feasible and highly, uh, so highly achievable and highly important. So those are the criteria that we use. In terms of evaluation, when we asked people what they thought of this process, the vast majority of people increased their knowledge about food environments. They increased their knowledge about some of the things that are happening across North America and made some new connections or strengthened existing relationships. But we also acknowledge that this food environment policy framework that we've developed, it is uh, 
sort of one piece looking at food environments, but I think what we've been hearing from the conversations we've been having is that there's a desire for this to be a little bit more broad. So in terms of things like uh, right now, the food epi framework doesn't include food security. And that's a really big issue for a lot of local municipalities. It's what people want to talk about. And so uh, we'd like to incorporate that into the tool. Right now, we don't have a real focus on sustainability and environment. So there's no focus on agricultural production, processing, transportation, food waste, all of those um, programs which we know contribute both to both personal and planetary health. And we lo limited our policy search thus far to North American policies because we wanted to make it really relevant to the Canadian context. But we might be missing some of the exciting and vanguard local policies that are being implemented internationally. And I, I think most people have heard of this. I certainly hear this almost every day in my work right now. People talking about the Eat Lancet report and the commission and the great food transformation that they're calling for. And I think that really we're starting to have conversations more broadly than just healthy diets to talk about healthy diets from sustainable food systems. And so I think that I know that globally as the food epi tool, both the, as the national tool is continuing to evolve, they're starting to include indicators of um, sustainability. And this is really something that we'd like to in increase as well. I think that starting to think more about the focus on plant-based foods and these plant-forward diets, as well as food waste, needs to be incorporated in some of these tools. It's not currently in the food epi, but I'd really like to hear your um, some of your thoughts on how how that moves forward so I'm just gonna slowly finish up here um, but I, I was thinking you know how do we move forward and what's the road forward in, in terms of promoting healthy sustainable local food environments and I actually think that the road probably looks a little bit more like this in terms of how, what approaches we're going to take. And this is really where local policy plays an important role because there's lots of uh, efforts that are ongoing that are sort of parallel or in concert with some of the policies that I'm talking about. And I think this is really going to inform where we're going in the future. But I don't think that there's a straightforward path. I think that because we know local context is different and that policy opportunities are different, that what we're going to see is the continuation of these interesting and novel local food environment policies. And, and it's going to be an important as we develop our understanding of how they work and how to best implement them. And I'm just going to highlight this paper that we came across in our study um, because it's an important perspective for me and, and maybe for others as well. This is a paper by Candice McForek at the University of Alberta and, and others. And it was looking specifically at drive-through brands in Canada. So who had implemented them and how they had been implemented. So 27 municipalities in Canada have, have some sort of drive-through bans in Canada. And there's more than 77 in the US. So suffice it to say, there are quite a few municipalities who are moving in this direction. And there was a real, um, so they, they did a deep dive into the type of bans and, and what their motivation or the intention was. And this is a group of researchers who is specifically interested in obesity and they had framed the paper as obesity related interventions. And when they looked at the actual intentions of the community and why they, what they had put forward in their policy documents, the most, con most concern was about community walkability and then community aesthetics and traffic concerns, urban design and promoted a sustainable and economically uh, sound downtown core, as well as air pollution and idling. And not a single one included obesity as one of the intentions or the purposeful intentions for reducing obesity. And so I think that this is just an important uh, uh, reminder to us that sometimes we can achieve things through different areas and that local, um, uh, there may be local momentum that we can uh, use that can benefit multiple areas of our city planning. So, um, 
And the last piece I'm going to just mention is that there's a, quite a few of these natural experiments that are unfolding. And so I hope in our discussion today, we can chat a little bit about uh, if there are some exciting policy advances that you know of that are going on, because there's really opportunities with researchers to work with some of these innovators and early adopters of policy to understand the impact of policy um, in these different areas. So that's something that I um, get quite excited about as we can think about how we can evaluate some of these po local environment policies. So lastly, I'll just talk, uh, just briefly mention some of the exciting work that's going on both globally and here in Canada in terms of uh, supporting local food policy. So the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact and the C4 Cities, these are really focused on um, really a sustainability, climate change, and environmental focus. But there are some really interesting resources from, from both of those groups. We do have lots of local food policy councils that are popping up both in Canada and the US. Often these have a food security and local food system, but I think that there is again an opportunity to leverage these to talk about food security, local sustainable food systems, and health all in the same conversation. And then the last piece that I'll highlight because I find I draw a lot of um, inspiration from this is the Northern Manitoba Food, Culture, and Community Collaborative. They have um, a resource called their Community Stories Book. And they have pulled together stories from uh, communities across Northern Manitoba that are really implementing some important food system changes. Um, but they're very context specific and they're very community led. And so there's some real inspiration, I think, to be drawn from some of these efforts where uh, you know, collaborative approaches are, are being used to support uh, healthy food environments. So with that, I think I'll wrap up. Here's my contact information. I'd love to, to hear from you. And uh, again, a special thanks to my colleagues, Kimia, who uh, finished her thesis just last year, and, and Mary LeBay at the University of Toronto. So with that, I have the discussion points that we've pulled up, and um, I'll hand it back over to you, Tina. Thanks so much, Lana. And apologies for those of you online who had audio issues. Um, I hope you are able to connect through another means to the phone. I know we didn't have a, a toll-free number, um, and uh, for some reason our computer audio is disabled. Um, it's normally enabled, so I'll, we'll, we'll look into that. So um, hopefully. Um, you were able to connect through another suggested method. So um, we'll go into discussion then. Um, so as I mentioned, you can type in your comments and questions into the chat box. And we'll start with questions for Lana. If anybody has questions for her, you can either, either put them into the chat box or you can um, let me know if you want to speak up and I can unmute you. Um, so while we wait for questions to come in, maybe we'll start with the first uh, discussion question. Um, so for those of you on the phone, this is not just for you to, to comment to Lana or to, you know, um, it's not really just, just a one-way conversation. This is more of a multi-way discussion. You can talk among, you know, participants with each other to learn from each other and so on. So the first one um, is, who have you worked with or talked with about creating healthy local food environments? And I know we have quite a few people online with a variety of different portfolios and expertise and knowledge. So we would love to hear from you about um, the stakeholders and people that you have worked with or talked with in your jurisdictions, in your um, cities or provinces, or even across the country about um, working on creating healthy local food environments. Okay, so one uh, comment came in, um, recreation departments and municipalities. Yeah, I, I think that that's a really great suggestion because I do think that particularly um, when we talk about sort of settings-based approaches, that recreation centers have been identified not only as an important place, but also as a place that is really willing to partner. Um, uh, so I think that that is a, is a great suggestion. Um, 
And I don't actually know if we specifically included any in the, the local food app because that's sort of only one of the sort of broad environments, but I think it's a good, it's a great suggestion. Oh, and a question came in. Uh, is the local food IP tool available to use in our own jurisdictions as part of our own assessment work? Yeah, so uh, yes, it certainly is. So um, this was Kimia's thesis, and it hasn't been published yet. Um, we do have several reports, and um, the link is in the, the slides, which I'm going to share with Tina so that you can have a look at the different reports. Um, so yes, absolutely it's available. Um, one of our challenges is a capacity challenge. So we're not um, able right now, we don't have the funding to support its implementation um, to, to a great extent. But we'd be happy to have some conversations about helping people implement it themselves. Um, and yes, it, it, it's absolutely available. And if you're, you're interested, if you want to contact me, um, I can work on getting you the, the information that might help you um, see if it would fit within your work. Great. Um, and Lana, if you want to look at the, the comments that are coming in, feel free to just go to the chat box and take a look. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. So I and, see sorry. Linda had a question about municipalities with policies for mobile food vendors. Um, so I see I think if I recall correctly, there was maybe one or two. Um, and it, they're not always focused on sort of healthy eating. Sometimes they are just like a complete ban of food trucks. Um, but I do, so I, I think that there's a bit of a niche with that. Um, so I don't think off the top of my head I have any great examples, but there certainly are some efforts. Um, and, you know what's interesting about that question is that a lot of um, low and middle income countries are starting to create some really neat policies around this because they have mobile food vendors <clears throat> pardon me, are a very big um, challenge for them because that's where uh, that, that sort of is the what is available particularly around schools and things like that. So um, yeah, I think that um, th that there's probably some resources to be dug up. Um, but I don't have any great examples from our North American context. I think I heard about in the States, I don't think it's happening in Canada, but I think there are some mobile green cards. Not necessarily, they're not really food trucks per se, but they are trucks that bring um, groceries to food desert areas um, to sell, you know, uh, produce. And um, I guess that's a part of trying to create a healthy food environment in a sense as well. Yes, yeah, so, so, sir, yeah, sorry, sir, sir, certainly I've heard of those as well. Um, in particular, in, um, in Baltimore, there are some real efforts around that. Um, so, yes, I certainly have some references for some of those mobile markets that, that they've been implementing to, to try right. to get healthy foods in food and uh, food desert, yeah. Uh, there's a question, uh, comment um, from Jessica. We have a community group called Food for All that consists of reps from public health, community health, agricultural reps, and volunteers. Great. So, I mean, I think that that's a little bit like these food policy councils that are popping up where basically, um, and that's one of our, our good practice indicators as well in terms of infrastructure support is having the ability to have conversations with all of the important stakeholders. Because what, what we've come to acknowledge is that having one-sided conversations just with government or just with industry or just among the community is not actually, um, is not actually conducive to getting these policies implemented. Um, and because we, you need the support from all the different stakeholder groups. So I think that that's an exciting initiative and, and that more more needs to be done around that, and that's certainly one of the recommendations that there are platforms and that those platforms are supported by municipal government so that they have the funding to effectively have conversations around some of these policy pieces. Mm -hmm. um, some other stakeholders are identified include local food council, local po po poverty reduction partnership, partners within, within health, if, for example, public health inspectors, 
um, and also places of worship um, and food security networks, um, food policy council, child care facilities, corner stores, schools, also currently working with our city planning department to draft new official plans. That's a lot of, lot, lot of interesting stakeholders. Yeah, no doubt. And I mean, I think that that's, um, that type of approach will, you know, certainly garner more perspective and, and help you understand some of the challenges and barriers as well as the opportunities. So, mm -hmm. A question came in for you from Jennifer. Do you think the, um, um, sorry, I can't, I, it's H-A-E-S has a place in healthy food environments considering the impact weight stigma has on obesity? Uh, can you, I, I don't actually know what H-A-E-S is. I'm having a moment here, or maybe I do. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> Jennifer, can you confirm who that is? Help at every side. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, it certainly does. And I think uh, I am starting to learn more and more about some of the work that Obesity Canada is doing around weight stigma. And it's, it's a bit ironic because I think that there's a movement towards when we're talking about food policies, talking about non-communicable disease prevention and not talking about obesity prevention specifically. Um, and uh, it's something that I'm starting to try to embrace a little bit more because I know that there's more, there's less stigma attached to policies when they're attached to eating as opposed to obesity. Um, and, you know, it's a challenge because I do a lot of work in menu labeling. And one of the, something that comes up all the time is, well, you know, is this creating additional weight stigma? And is it, you know, adding to some of the challenges already faced by people who are living with obesity? So I think that it certainly needs to be part of the conversation. And in particular, for framing some of the solutions. Um, and some of the interventions to make sure that they're not weight focused, but that they're healthy living focused and that they're healthy eating focused because those have, it has implications well beyond uh, just obesity. Um, Jennifer, do you have any other thoughts on that? I mean, I, I know that certainly in, in other communities, it's, um, it's not necessarily that there's representatives from all of these different areas that are available, but I do think that uh, when when those people want to contribute, they're really important to a stakeholder at the table. And if anyone else I, uh, has other comments on that, I'd I'd love to hear how. Uh, you know, how that sort of holistic approach as opposed to a stigmatized obesity approach can be used in some of these policy discussions. Mm -hmm. A comment that came in related to that, I think it's also about how you make the case for the food environment work and using obesity statistics as rationale, knowing that weight is not a behavior and it is the behaviors that concern us and that we have no effective way, effective way for people to lose weight and keep it off. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Carolyn, and, and I really appreciate that comment. And one of the things that I just try to use those statistics because I really want to focus on the fact that this is not an individual issue. This is not people choosing to eat more or making one bad choice, but this is an environment that we've created that is causing problems for us systemically. And so we really can't focus on changing behaviors of individuals. Uh, we need to focus on changing the environment so that it's not up to the individual to make a so-called good choice, that those good choices are the automatic and are the default. Um, mm -hmm. And it's interesting because when you look at all of these food environment policies, some, some people frame them as soft policies or, or hard policies, but soft policies are policies sometimes um, when it requires people to make better decisions. So, for example, changing the nutrition information environment and labeling, that still requires people to understand that information 
and then select electively use it to make different food decisions. Mm -hmm. And whereas things like changing the food supply or change increasing accessibility, it has less to do with those decisions and it has more to do about uh, really making that sort of the default. So I think that there's different approaches and certainly some are better at supporting um, that sort of environmental approach than others. Mm -hmm, for sure. Nicely said. Um, <clears throat> so next comment. Um, in Saskatchewan, to begin evaluating and addressing food environments and publicly funded recreation facilities, we engage partners from research policy and practice from health and recreation sectors to help design and govern the evaluation. So far, it appears to be a successful approach. There seems to be ownership in continuing forward into planning and implementing implementation of changes. This is from Melanie. <clears throat> yeah, Melanie, and I love that the comment on ownership because I think that that's part of what we recognize in this local food epi is that if if you want people to get excited about it and build momentum, that they have to feel like they are a part of the process and they're not just being told what to do. And as part of our national food epi. Um, last, last time we did the process in 2017, we had government stakeholders that we included as observers, but we didn't actually include them in the process. Uh, and our rationale for that was, well, you know, we don't, we, we want to make sure that they're not biasing our results. And that actually what we've learned and other countries have learned is that when you include government in those and the people who actually would be implementing and creating those policies and regulations, you're actually more likely to get uptake of your results and have more useful discussions at the end of the day. And so um, we are changing our approach and now going to be including some of those government stakeholders because um, we know that they're, they, they often have the most, um, you know, the most experience. They know exactly what the opportunities are and what some of the barriers are that might not be as obvious to people on, from the outside. So, yeah, I, I love that, um, the idea of having people, having a really broad stakeholder group to take ownership. Um, next uh, comment, we have collaborated with professional planners to include supportive language within our regional official plan. Um, and um, Jessica also mentioned that they have hired a professional planner to review all area official plans. She identified many opportunities for municipalities to improve official plan language in the food environment domain. That's Interesting. And, yeah, and I, I'm always, I'm intrigued by that because I, I always wonder, um, you know, when we talk about professional planners, um, how, are, how much are they able to incorporate some of these different perspectives in terms of healthy food environments and sustainability and local economic factors and all of that. But I think it's a, it's, um, a really great point because I think there perhaps in, it sounds like there may be an unused or untapped sort of resource to support um, using the appropriate language so that you can get other people on board. Okay, I'm looking for the next uh, comment. Um, Melanie, I think, just replied and said, um, I've read some research the need to engage food industry for that same reason, to gain uptake. Any thoughts? Um, so this is a, one of the trickiest navigation paths to navigate in my field um, because Certainly the food industry are the people that are implementing a lot of these policies are very, very much affected by some of these policies. And there's really different camps on this. Um, my personal thoughts are that industry needs to be a part of the conversation at, at a certain point, but I think often that is after the, the regulations have been drafted and made to decide how exactly it will be implemented. But the motivation for the policies and the rationale for whether or not they are uh, likely to be effective, effective and, and that they can be effectively implemented, I think that those conversations need to happen 
with less dialogue from the food industry so that we're not going to get a biased, um, a biased policy outcome. And that's a real focus of some of the food infrastructure, the infrastructure support pieces, is making sure that there's a transparent, transparent process that's informing um, the policy decisions. And in the healthy eating strategy, as you might know, they, in terms of uh, their uh, consultations, they did do consultations with industries, with uh, academia, and with the general public. But in terms of their consultations with the industry, anything that was submitted or any communications between the industry and Health Canada, particularly in regard to the food guide, but also the marketing to kids in the front of pack labeling, that all has to be posted publicly. So any submissions by food industry, any conversations that are had, any meetings that are had, the minutes, they're all publicly available. So that's a very transparent process. And I think that's really key in some of these policy decisions is making sure that 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 is that everyone knows exactly what's going on. And um, I mean some of the challenges that I have with the a food policy for Canada is that they, they haven't necessarily said that they're going to have the same transparent discussions and certainly any lobbying and efforts that are being directed towards agriculture and agri-food Canada are not public in the same way that those efforts directed towards Health Canada are. So there's still opportunities for food industry to interfere in some of these policy decisions and it's probably uh, you know, not benefiting the momentum that's been gathered. Great, thanks for that, Lana. Um, if anyone wants to comment uh, or respond to Lana, feel free to type, in the, type into the chat box. Um, we'll go to the next comment from Carrie. So she asked, um, the City of Edmonton Recreation Centers houses um, Dairy Queen and other fast food vendors because they pay them big bucks for the space. What work has been done to educate municipalities on reasons why not to allow this? And um, Heather shared a couple examples below. Um, from um, Newfoundland. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that's a really tricky one because oftentimes, particularly if it's uh, like a franchise, like Dairy Queen or fast food vendors, they have very little control over their ability to make foods, to require foods to be healthier. Um, so, so that's a challenging one, whereas if they're sort of locally owned or municipally owned um, food venues, vendors within recreation centers, there's a little bit more opportunity for intervention and dialogue. So I don't know, frankly, of any work that's working to educate municipalities, um, but I do think that there are some exciting uh, pol uh, you know, policy changes where um, people are just saying no more. We're not going. To, we're no longer to ha going to have Dairy Queen or heaven forbid, you cannot buy a Tim Hortons double double at the recreation center anymore because they don't meet our nutritional standards. So those are. Um, I mean, I think. I think what would really help would be an economic argument to say you can still make the same amount of money. Um, but I think that's going to be a pretty hard argument to make in some of the situations. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> sorry, Jennifer, did you want to speak up? Um, if you go to the center of your screen where and there's a as an icon labeled mic, um, yours is, pro is probably uh, muted right now. If you uh, if you click that, you should be able to unmute yourself so you can speak up. Okay. Um, next comment um, from Salima. Do you have some examples of in-store programs which support smaller retailers in providing healthier foods? And Crystal offered um, below, uh, they did a pilot project in Ottawa with corner stores to sell fresh vegetable and fruit and good food staples. Um, and she also provided a link to, the, to their work. Um, and I think uh, Leah Miniker in Waterloo and um, Kathy Ma in um, Nova Scotia also did quite a bit of work around um, uh, corner stores. Yeah, yeah. So that's I was that was what come to came to mind is the Freshet project that Leah and Kathy um, 
lead. Now, those are uh, really researcher-led um, interventions. So it's exciting to hear that Crystal um, did, uh, and Ottawa Public Health has done some work uh, on healthy growth, um, small retailers or healthy corner stores because, you know, um, oftentimes what happens is as researchers, we, you know, create some really great interventions and we have good evidence that they start to work, but then they never actually get implemented. So I think that um, there's certainly some research examples that I know of, maybe fewer government, um, uh, fewer government-led uh, initiatives, but if anyone else has other examples, I'd love to hear them. Crystal mentions they did a collaborative publication with Leah and Kathy showing the different healthy corner store models across Canada. Um, she'll see if she can find the link. Ah, great. Great. And I saw one more question from Jessica that said, how do you get government stakeholders, et cetera, to buy in to support local food policies? Um, yeah. I wish I had a little bit more expertise in this because um, th so there's some exciting work that some colleagues do at University of Alberta to, to look at policy readiness. Um, so this is the idea of where municipalities might be and how you might be able to get them ready to be more open to some uh, healthy eating and, and healthy policies. Um, and uh, that's the Alberta Coalition for, oh, they have a long acronym that I can't think of right now, but Kim Rain is the, the lead for that. Um, and they have done some work about how you can get some of this buy-in and support for, for more policies. All of the, the people that we've worked with so far have been sort of excited about trying to implement local food policies and they already have some momentum. Um, so I, I might suggest that you, you have a look there. Um, and I'd love to hear uh, if people on the line have suggestions for how they've successfully gained or garnered buy-in from their uh, governments and stakeholders. Yeah, thank you, Tina. The Alberta Policy Coalition for Prevention. That's right. Perfect. Thank you. Maybe we'll move on to the next discussion question. Um, I know we covered a little bit about uh, the second question. What are the policy areas that seem to be getting the most traction for food policy in local Canadian policy, uh, municipalities or regions? It sounds like a recreation centers maybe are, are a bit of a focus right now with some of the some of the people on the line. Are there other areas that people are seeing some momentum around? Or perhaps what 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 have you um, prioritized in your your um, areas? Food waste reduction from Melanie. Yeah, and that's part of a food policy for Canada as well. And food reclamation. Oh, interesting. And Sabrina says having a food charter solidifies more action in food security realm in our communities. Yeah, so there's certainly a several, I'm aware of several food charters that have been introduced across Canada as sort of the official um, approach or policy to how local food systems are going to be supported. <clears throat> and I think, I think the food security angle is an interesting one too because I think that there's, um, when we start talking about food security, it's not just access to food, it's access to healthy um, healthy and acceptable food. So uh, I think that that's a, a nice avenue in to talk about if we're, we need to make sure that everyone is fed as a sort of right to food. And I know Food Secure Canada has some real efforts around making sure that the right to food is, is acknowledged in different documents. Policy areas include early, um, early on centers, childcare, food insecurity, um, 
another comment from Jennifer, Dr. Mackenzie Moore has a, a lot of great research on community-based social marketing and has presented to various public health audiences. Um, hmm. I'm going to look that up, McK Dr. Mackenzie Moore. I haven't come across them. And Sabrina mentioned recently we have created food asset maps that forecast where facilities are located for the most vulnerable populations in our urban and rural communities. Oh, very cool. So interactive asset maps based on the social determinants of health. Hmm. Interesting. And Heather mentioned food came up a lot from a public during the municipal online surveys about climate adaptation and mitigation planning for Halifax. Yeah, I, I mean, I do think that, um, as I mentioned just so ever so briefly at the end, um, that this idea of this great food transformation and talking about healthy diets from sustainable food systems, the importance of that can't be overlooked. And it also is an opportunity where, okay, well, if some people care about sustainability and some people care about healthy eating. Everybody gets their way because really there's so much overlap between those two different um, Different policy areas. So, yep, I think that I think that that is a real opportunity right now because we know even in our federal election that that seems to play quite a big role in terms of climate change. And I think I'm just starting to learn more about the sustainability, in particular the climate change aspects of food. But to know that our food production is responsible for one third of all global greenhouse gases, those statistics I don't think people are quite aware of them. And so. I think there's a lot of knowledge and awareness to do about it. I also think, though, challenging, we can't get people to uh, eat well for their own health. So how challenging will it be to get people to eat well for the planet's health? So those are just some of the, the pieces that I try to think about as I'm laying awake at night. Um, I'm just looking at the comment from Emily here that says, in the Ontario context, there's language in the provincial land use policy, planning policy framework to develop complete communities, which would include increasing access to and availability of healthy local food, so aligning with larger community planning goals. And I think that um, there, there's certainly, well, we talk, talk a little bit about the local policy context and, and understanding what the provincial uh, context is like. And I think that this is a real key. And some of the, um, some of it is just trying to understand the legislation and what can be leveraged. So I think that that's a, a, a really good suggestion in, in Ontario. And I think um, I'm aware in, in the evidence documents from the Food Epi that there were, we identified several other provincial um, level documents that are related to healthy eating that would then have implications through municipal policies. So I encourage people to have a look there if they, um, if they um, are interested in their province. Maybe we'll move on to, um, there's a question that came in. Um, can you share any examples where an activity in one community has inspired similar action in another, in another community? Um, I mean, that's a, it's, it's easier to track a little bit in some of the bigger policy areas. So as I mentioned, like in menu labeling, where there was a sort of proliferation of local policies or in sugar and beverage taxes, where there's, there's this clear evidence, and as soon as there's a legal challenge and it's one, it's easier for others. Um, in terms of Canada, I don't have any great examples, but I'd love to hear from others. Um, because often, this is one of the challenges with doing this type of work, is often there's really great um, work going on, but it's not easily accessible on websites. It's not out there on social media. And so it's hard for us to understand what some of these sort of policy diffusion stories are. So um, I'd love to hear them. There's a comment that came in from Carolyn. Um, the former Champlain um, Cardiovascular Disease Prevention Project originated the development of the Healthy Foods in Hospitals, which recommended a nutritional framework 
to design healthy food and beverage offerings across Champlain um, hospital retail food settings, namely cafeteria, vending, franchise, and volunteer op uh, operations. It covers all hospitals in the Champlain L uh, Lynn with, with hospitals working towards bronze, silver, or gold level. A really interesting um, initiative, and I, my thesis work was on uh, menu labeling in Ottawa hospitals, so it's always near and dear to my heart to hear what's going on in, in the Ottawa region. They know there's, there's some momentum for healthy foods in their hospitals, so that's great. There has been some good work between public health and planning professionals over the past 10 years or so to shift official, official plan policies, but less work done on zoning bylaws, for example, what uses are permitted in certain areas. The focus on zoning could address issues of proximity of fast food chains in relation to schools, for example, as well as permit growth in small agricultural operations where minimum lot sizes are currently prohibited. So moving from policy to bylaws that have teeth. However, policies and bylaws are reflective of our values, so change will only happen if we value access to local food, local food security, and food sovereignty. Yeah, Kate, and you know what, um, my, when I wear my researcher hat and I read that, I think, yeah, you're absolutely right, and what would help is to also change some of those values and perhaps shift for some policy support is if we could get, some, if, if when that's implemented, if, if there are policies that are implemented, that those are evaluated so that we can see what the impact of those is, because often that um, evidence can help to shift the opinions of some of the stakeholders, uh, in particular pol decision, policy decision makers, um, when they can see that there's going to be tangible efforts and it's something that they can point to to say, yeah, this is, you know, this is something that we want to do. But yeah, certainly it's a challenge. And we, we didn't find, um, I don't think in any uh, of our, in any of the provinces or any uh, on the national level, any zoning bylaws in Canada. There were drive-through bans, but those are slightly different than the zoning bylaws. Mm -hmm. I guess zoning bylaws will also include um, what types of grocery stores, or how many grocery stores, or how many food outlets might be in a community. Yeah, and that's one of the policy areas, um, and I know um, that uh, there's, there's some work and some attention being paid to some of those zoning bylaws in terms of um, when a grocery store comes in and then there can't be other food stores implemented in the same sort of area. So I, I know that there's some work to be done by that. Often it just, then it's not like really a healthy food focus. Um, it's more of an economic argument. Right. Maybe in the, so in the last 10 minutes, we'll move on to the next question. Um, what are the opportunities for various stakeholders, such as researchers, practitioners, and policymakers to, to support and leverage ongoing work that's also being, already being conducted at a municipal or a regional level? Um, I know from our perspective, and I, I mentioned this briefly, but one of the challenges was really just identifying what are some of the exciting policies that have been implemented. Um, so that we can a include them in our local food epi as examples of you know some of the good practices that are happening, um, as well as to identify opportunities where we can maybe uh, we as researchers can maybe evaluate some of those policies and work with um, with local groups who are interested in knowing what the impact has been of some of those policies. So that's um, something that I would you know look look to is in terms of an opportunity. If you have any, any more comments or questions related to previous discussion points, feel free to bring them up too. So I guess while we wait for more questions and comments to come in, I just wanted to mention that um, the recording of the webinar will be posted on the forum. And uh, because, uh, uh, so the forum also has, um, there's, there's a discussion thread where, which you can contribute discussions to. So uh, feel free to continue discussions online through the forum, and uh, well, I'll be including all the links that are shared in the discussion on the forum as well. And uh, Lana will also be sending me, um, she will be sharing some links as she mentioned in the presentation um, in, in, uh, on the forum as well. 
Well, maybe this will, is just an opportunity for me to do one last plug to say if um, you or others in your, uh, your group or community uh, are interested in uh, talking about the food epi, um, uh, using the local food epi, that I'd be really happy to hear from you. And um, I see um, someone said, when the tool is published, what are the next steps for promoting and sharing it? So, I mean, this is part of that effort is, is to get the word out that we, you know, have this tool and that um, it's, uh, it's open for business if people are interested in it. And I think the other, um, the other piece is that there, we're trying to really stay um, tuned with some of the other conversations around what kind of tools are being um, developed because there are other co more comprehensive tools that do include um, more elements of sustainability, which we know is really of interest to local municipal partners. So um, suffice it to say, uh, classic researcher answer, but with a little bit more funding, we are hoping to um, move this forward and, and hopefully uh, help support other groups that might be interested. And um, for those in Ontario, Public Health Ontario has also um, has a real interest in looking at local food environment policies, and so there might be some opportunities to work with them. Um, so yeah, I hope people will reach out. Thanks, Lana. Do you want to go back to a slide where, where your contact information is? Yeah, sure. There we go. Uh, Sabrina commented, we worked with the District of Squamish, that's in BC, um, on their official community plan, and they, they endorsed food systems into their OCP with chapters focusing on sustainability, agriculture, food production, and distribution. That's a great example of working closely with um, municipalities and um, um, planners more and more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. And I think that trying to come up with how you can incorporate all of the different aspects of healthy eating and planetary health is certainly going to strengthen all of those community plans. So I like, I like that uh, sort of all-encompassing approach. So. And yes, Carrie, the slides will be available. So I'll, I'll post those on the forum as well in a PDF. Great, thank you. Well, if there are no more comments or questions, um, we, I guess we'll wrap up the webinar. And uh, thank you so much, Lana, for the insightful presentation and discussions. And thank you, everyone, for contributing to the great discussion. Um, lots of great information and uh, great connections. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, yeah, I look forward to hopefully hearing from some of you.